wins too. Resistance, of course, is the 22,275 mark, which is actually coming in. Well, the 22,200 mark becomes extremely important. And I'll tell you why. Because the 22,200 put has the highest open interest on the put side. We worked hard to get here and uh, we'll work hard to stay here. We have mostly in the manifesto seen continuation of existing uh, schemes. Nifty Bank is down about three quarters of a percent. Skriva continues to do pretty well. You know, so uh, the new conversions are close to about 31, 32 percent. We had guided 205 crores of PAT. We revised that in December to 220 and we uh, ended up at 226. Nifty Bank also not much compared to the Nifty but still down a percent. So 0.53 percent as compared to around 0.2 percent. We have a very competitive spectrum portfolio. Day in the red, 170 points lower on the Nifty. Well, that's the day so far, and uh, it's been quite a red kind of a day through the course of uh, the last many hours. And as we begin uh, the last hour of trade here on Closing Bell, the market slipped a bit more. We're down full 200 points. This is Closing Bell. We're coming to you from the CNBC TV 18 Motor Rosewall Studios. I am Prashant. With me, my colleague Survi and Nigel. Guys, hi. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That was Prashant. You saw there making those <laughs> phone calls, figuring figuring out, you know, what the buzz is in dealing rooms and why is this market mm. uh, not buying. But actually, we, we don't know whether the second <clears throat> dip gets bought or not. But uh, yeah, it's a bit tricky. After Friday, this is another tricky session. Well, that's right. You know, you thought that you were out of the woods when you saw the bit of a bounce coming in closer to around the 20 DMA. But that's not to be because the second round of selling has come about. But I have to note a couple of positives in today's trading session. You pull up the Nifty, you pull up the 20 DMA. And you'll see still we have defended that mark. So that's point number one, 22,263. That's the low of the day. So that's point number one. And point number two is at least you have more than 400 stocks that are advancing. At one point of time in the first hour of trade, there were only 150 stocks that were advancing. And that crisscross line actually is so apart that that picture is not, uh, you know, you're not getting that uh, picture. But actually, at one point of time, there were way more uh, stocks that were declining in capacity advancing. At least that gap has narrowed a little bit. Maybe by the end of trade, if you could see the advances number pop up to 600, 700 odd, the bulls will feel, well, we had a decent session. On the, top, on the headline index, we got hit. And some stocks did well from the broader markets as well. Uh, absolutely. But uh, Prashant, <coughs> I mean, overall, I think uh, the yeah. market has had a lot to deal with, right? Uh, on Friday, we were talking about taxation issues over the weekend. There's far bigger sort of you know global geopolitical risk that's on, on the minds. Yeah. Uh, and I guess the market's taking note of it now. Yeah, but I, I think uh, the market in any case, even before uh, geopolitics, etc., was looking a little uh, iffy and, uh, you know, not just here in India, but in the U.S. as well. In India, we've had minor small corrections. In the U.S., we've had nothing, right? Uh, and that is the reason why it... Uh, the U.S., by the way, the S&P, for example, is now trading... Uh, the, actually, you should look at the S&P E-mini futures as a more liquid contract. Uh, that's now trading very close to its 55-day average, and that typically is indicated... A break of that is indicated a bit of a pullback in the past. So... You know, uh, uh, overall, many indices were looking uh, kind of uh, ripe for a bit of a uh, sort of sideways move, maybe a little bit of a pullback. Will we get that or once again, it's going to be short-lived shallow? That's the question, really. We are once again, as I said, as we approach the last, get into the last 60 minutes, really, uh, getting close to the 20-day average. So 22 to 70 is the 20-day. As of yesterday's close, we're about 30 points above it. Uh, the intraday, of course, that 20-day was broken on the downside for a brief bit by a little bit. And then, of course, there was a strong bounce which came through again. By the way, the Nifty Bank on Friday, Nifty had already broken the hourly averages on Friday. And then we're looking at the daily averages. Bank Nifty had not broken the hourly averages, which has happened now. And here, I mean, I think uh, in a, with about 200, 250 or points of, below from where we are trading right now, uh, you know, supports, etc. start to uh, come in. Uh, so a lot to track here as we get into the thick of things. But uh, market breadth, I think that is one indicator. Our advances, declines outnumbering advances by some. Uh, four is to one, the last I checked. As Nigel said, the number was 10 is to one in the morning. So there is some improvement, which is set in. Sorry. Oh, absolutely. But the, the way the screen is looking right now, it's a mm. complete sea of red. There's uh, no sector rotation. There's no leadership. Barring Reliance, by the way, and that stock's going to be critical in determining how we ultimately close up. Uh, Reliance is pretty much a lone ranger trying to you know, negate a lot of this uh, downslide that we're getting. And then a few of the commodity names. Once again, it's uh, ONGC, Hindalco, some of the commodity stocks that are up and about. Otherwise, the Bank Nifty is leading the decline with a 1.5% drop. Uh, technology hasn't exactly lit up the charts after TCS, even though those margins were better than anticipated. But I guess it's the commentary. It's not really inspiring much 
on tech stocks. So tech is weak. Uh, other large names uh, like Lever, l &T, nothing really is firing for the bulls today. And I really would want to see what uh, we get by way of FII numbers today. Because if you mm -hmm. remember on Friday, there was a massive 8,000 crore rupees of sell. A lot of it was negated by domestic institutions. They bought what 6,000 crores. But if the selling continues to be as huge, then uh, you know, will it be fully absorbed or not by domestic institutions? Those are the questions that we have to consider. So I'm watching out for the FPI number uh, quite closely. Today. Well, that's right. You know, and just a couple of banking names. CSB Banks here, what a beautiful chart that is. You know, the stock is up close to on 5% in a market that's actually seeing a lot of selling pressure. I think that it has a fair bit of exposure to gold, and that's got something to do with this kind of up move that we're seeing. The stock is up close to on 5% now. We had the management who joined us, Mr. Mundal, uh, just uh, I think a, a, a week or so ago, and he sounded very, very optimistic on business. And he's been maintaining that tone for the last few quarters as well. In today's trading session, the stock is up 5%. Remember, the Nifty Bank is down 700 points. If you see any names that are doing well, that to a banking name, it's definitely got a lot of uh, interest, at least as we speak, in very, very high volumes on that front. But let's find out what you do on the index because we had a bit of a bounce. That bounce got sold into. Mitesh Takkar is with us. Mitesh, what do you make of today's trading action on the Nifty first? Do you believe that we want to go ahead and test lower levels? Uh, and what would the trade be first on the Nifty and the Nifty Bank? Good afternoon, Ajit. I think that's the view. You know, one, we had a gap down. Two, the gap down was closer to the support level of 22, 250, and therefore we had a bounce back. And I was mentioning this that, you know, the bounce back should be sold into levels of around 22, 400, 450 range. And we got a high of around 22, 422. So the gap is not filled. We are back to, you know, the lower end of the day's range. And uh, we got selling around the intraday averages, which is which is closer to about 22, 450 mark. So I think the market should most logically test lower levels. The uh, downside could be 22, 180 uh, to about 22, 150. That's the first level. But eventually, we, if we break those levels, we might head a bit lower as well. So the structure is weak, so I'm not trading on the long side. We're trading with clearly some kind of short bias. And uh, on the stock side as well, I have sell calls on Birla Soft. Uh, Bsoft is a sell with a stop just above 726 uh, and a target of 680 can be looked at over here. And the other stock which I have is a sell on granules, uh, which I would recommend selling with a stop at about uh, 418 for a target of 390. Okay, all right. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for that. Madesh, we'll keep coming back to you as the hour progresses. By the way, a couple of these larger cap names have seen some bit of buying. Mahindra and Mahindra pull up the intraday chart. The stock was down close to 2% earlier today. That's seeing some, uh, some buying interest. The stock has just moved into the green as we speak. And Maruti Suzuki is the other one as well that's seeing some kind of buying interest from lower levels. So that one as well, holding in the green with a gain of around 1.3%. So it's good to see some of these stocks. But the one that's really bucking the trend and the one that's the top gainer on the Nifty is ONGC. It's passing today on the back of a positive note that comes in from Jefferies, which has initiated coverage on the stock. Sonal joins us to fill us in with more details. Sonal. Uh, well, yes, Jefferies is quite bullish on ONGC. They have initiated a coverage on the stock with a buy rating and a target price of 390 rupees a share. They say that the reforms in the crude oil market and the gas market have improved substantially in Indian context. And ONGC's profitability is now above its decadal averages as well. They're seeing strong free cash flow generation from here on and also net debt reduction, which of course will be positive for their balance sheet as well. Also, the valuation is not capturing the growth prospects that the company is looking at and it is still trading at a steeper discount to Nifty compared to its long-term average and that is what uh, makes them like the stock as well. They expect ONGC's domestic production to return to growth from FI24 to FI26. We have been seeing a decline in the production levels. Uh, they reckon that KG Basin production will be profitable despite higher OPEX that the company will, be, uh, will have to undertake. And this is something which is seen in their financials already, the OPEX number higher due to the KG AG Basin uh, reforms. Uh, they are building in 1% production growth over the next two financial years without assuming a resolution in ONGC Videsh. Um, they are also talking about a consolidated net debt to equity which will fall from 0.32 times to 0.16 times over the next three financial years. They have a buy rating with a target price of 390 rupees a share. Okay, got that. Sonal, thank you very much. ONGC indeed has been uh, leading the charts today and it's uh, very consistent. I mean, those gains are intact. In fact, uh, the stock seems to be building on them now with a you near know, 6% up move. Deepan Mehta, director at Elixir Equities, is with us on the show today. Deepan, good afternoon. Great to have you on as always. So ONGC, I guess it's you know it's good going. Crude oil prices have jumped 15-16% so far in just this calendar year alone. 
and you, you perhaps just heard the Jeffrey's view there. Uh, what's your own take on ONGC? Yeah, so good afternoon and thank you for having me on your show. I think ONGC certainly is a value play, but look at the track record last 15, 20 years or so, it's not created any value for shareholders. And from that point of view, you want to be circumspect. At any point of time, you can justify a buy in ONGC, but what actually happens is that the numbers, when they come through, I think two, three quarters, they are good, then something or the other goes wrong. And uh, you know there's earnings volatility and the numbers don't come up to street expectations. So therefore, the stock uh, the stock's multiple has remained pretty much depressed. Uh, but yes, I think oil prices have gone up and let's hope uh, that uh, ONGC is able to keep most of the realization uh, because there's also government interference in terms of taxation as to, you know, this windfall tax also can come from time to time and that may impact the earnings. But I am not convinced about the volume growth of ONGC. They've been talking about a volume growth on the gas and the oil side for many, many years, but that has not come through. If that were to happen in a significant way, then I think the stock can be in a different zone. But uh, if that doesn't happen, then I think uh, you could have a trading rally, but it's not a great long-term investment. Okay, all right, uh, got that. Uh... Uh, Deepan, I wanted your view on a couple of other names. You know, I was just highlighting some of these uh, automakers are seeing buying from lower levels. Mahindra and Mahindra, you had Maruti Suzuki as well. Any view out there? Hey, Nigel, good afternoon. I think it's more to do with the expectations of very good quarter for the entire auto industry across the board, uh, you know, to be, with the exception of perhaps tractors and that two standalone tractor company. Uh, but uh, it's absolute blue sky scenario for the auto industry. Uh, the kind of average realization prices have gone up because of premiumization. Quality prices are still under control, so margins also will be higher. Volume growth has been pretty decent for these companies. And, uh, you know, the waiting list is gradually dwindling, which means that, you know, two, three quarters down the line, you could have slowing down of growth rates. But for the time being, I think March quarter, June quarter will be the best ever for the auto industry. And that's the reason why we are seeing, I think, uh, pre-result buying taking place. And valuations also pretty much reasonable to an extent. There's some more under ownership also if you exclude Maruti. And that's what's benefiting these companies per se. Mm. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Dipin, just coming back to you, uh, Aster DM has had a fantastic run, right? Uh, today, uh, it uh, I think it's off about 50 rupees from the day's highest point. Uh, so, But it's still got about 7% on it. The board's approved a special dividend, 118 rupees a share. This is at the higher end of what was expected by the street. Uh, we had the management with us earlier on as well, but let's just put this in perspective. Uh, Ekta is joining in with that. Ekta. Yes, absolutely. Aster DM is in focus because they've approved that special dividend of around 118 odd rupees per share. That is after they sold their Gulf business for over uh, 907 million dollars. So that's what they've netted post the transaction. And uh, the company, remember, had indicated that this uh, special dividend would be between 110 to 120 odd rupees. So it's at the higher end of that particular range. And that's probably what the street likes. Record date is April 23rd. The board may is not going to consider an interim dividend now, but they may consider a final dividend uh, in their Q4 board meet. Now, the company says that 80% of the proceeds that they've received will be used for special dividends. So, I think the street likes the fact that they have, um, you know, rewarded shareholders quite handsomely. 1,050 crores will be retained by the company. They will decide how to utilize that 1,050 crores. Most of the hospitals for them are now mature and hence cash flows are coming through. So that's an additional pos positive. Now, remember, promoters have a huge amount of pledge in the company itself, but they do have plans on uh, reducing it. The uh, management did mention that the promoter pledge will reduce soon. We don't know to what extent and by when. Uh, they are open to expansion in terms of an inorganic route as well. So totally, they're looking to expand their bed count to 6,600 in the next couple of years um, and probably take it to 10,000 in the next five years. They want to become one of the top three integrated healthcare companies in India. So that's their aim. They're looking to expand beyond their core south market. So they're looking to expand in Maharashtra and UP, etc. Now, remember that Olympus had sold a certain amount of stake in the company, around 10%. They have 10% uh, left. They said that it was picked up by FIIs and DIIs uh, and uh, currently Olympus is retaining that 10% stake. Uh, they're grow growing at 25% CAGR, hoping to grow around 15% CAGR in the next three to five years. Right, uh, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, so that is uh, 
you know, as a DM uh, with, the, with, the, with what's happened uh, earlier. This is uh, the management, uh, Nitish Shetty, CEO of Acid DM Healthcare. We spoke with him earlier on uh, some sound bites. 80% of the sale proceeds will be dividend out, a special dividend at 118 rupees per share. And around 1,500 crore will be retained uh, within India. Uh, the future of the 1,500 crore, how we want to use it, will be decided in the near future by the board. Because as I speak now, uh, we have clear cut plans for our expansion in terms of deploying 1,700 beds in three years. This we are going to do with our own internal accrual uh, because we have enough cash flow happening because most of our hospitals are matured now. Uh, for inorganic growth, we might consider uh, this uh, retained uh, amount of 1,500 crores, or we might leverage on our uh, share price, uh, which is which is doing well as you are aware of now. All right, uh, that is the management of uh, <clears throat> Astro DM uh, with some perspective. A uh, news flash at the bottom of the screen. So the India UK FTA, the free trade agreement, which has been which is being negotiated uh, for the last couple of years, there is an update there, and uh, talks are set to resume in May uh, slash June of 2024. So basically, uh, from next one next month onwards, the talks will resume, uh, and uh, talks are being planned in Brussels. One of the major areas which basically is uh, led to delays and kind of uh, you know, agreement has not been possible as liquor. Uh, import of uh, sort of, you know, uh, the fact that UK, uh, the industry wants access to the Indian liquor market in a much more substantial way. Uh, and uh, United Spirits has been one of, the, uh, one of the stocks, which is, of course, I mean, actually has been the number one stock there, uh, which can kind of get, gets excited whenever uh, there is news around uh, the India, UK, FT, et cetera, which starts to uh, come through when we talk about it. But I mean, it's not just th that, it'll be a whole range of products because it'll be a comprehensive FTA. Uh, Parishad has been reporting in the story and uh, others have uh, been doing so uh, as well. So that is uh, United Spirits at this point in time. Uh, Deepan, uh, just a quick word on, uh, I mean, if you want to comment on Adit, uh, sort of uh, Astrid DM or this, uh, or United Spirits, if you want, United Spirits of course had a decent week last week, but also Aditya Birla Capital, AB Capital, Macquarie came out with a note, this was early, early last week, saying it's the top pick in the NBFC space, where it's one of the uh, sort of few remaining diversified uh, sort of lenders in the NBFC space after Bajaj FinServe. Uh, and uh, there is a, by the way, the reason I'm asking that is because tomorrow there is a press conference, uh, AB Capital. Uh, the management will be there and uh, the promoter, Mr. Birla, will, al will also be there at the press conference. Uh, just, just your thoughts on AB Capital as well, apart from the others you may want to comment on. So let's, uh, Prashant, let's start with Astor DM. And until the point that they sold the Gulf business, uh, this company had been a laggard compared to its peer group. And uh, I was, in fact, quite bullish on the company because of its Gulf business. Uh, but that also ne never really performed to the to our expectation or to its true potential. And now that they have sold it and provided a huge value unlocking opportunity for shareholders, I must commend the management on that. And 80% of distribution of, of those gains back to the Shareholders is really very friendly from their point of view. Let's see how the domestic business now shapes up and whether they're able to start to outperform in terms of uh, underlying growth or the larger peer group companies. So from that point of view, I want to just wait and watch. Uh, the second company you spoke about was uh, Aditya Birla Capital. And it's at a discount to a lot of the large uh, diversified uh, NBFCs like say Bajaj Finance or Chola Mandalam for that matter. And gradually, I think that gap is uh, is narrowing. It's a conservative lender. So from that point of view, it has survived uh, you know, the last NBFC crisis pretty well. But then growth rates have been lower and uh, lower than some of its peer groups. So if growth rates were to improve and, and their collection efficiency would remain stable, then the street will start ascribing a higher and higher P multiple. But nonetheless, I think if you're underweight NBFC and you, know, you feel that Bajaj Finance and Chola Mandalama on the more expensive side, then certainly I think there is a play in Aditya Birla capital as well. And there's value unlocking uh, as far as subsidies are concerned. I'm sorry, which was the third stock you were you were discussing? I just lost that name. Uh, there was Aster DM, United Spirits and AB Capital. Yeah, United <laughs> Spirits, I think, <laughs> United Spirits is, <laughs> how can we forget about it? 
But uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, Nigel, you want to say something? <laughs> no, no. I know. think this is the extra market holiday impact that's playing out. But but yes, please go. By. We're all yours. Uh, let's get your take on Yarit Spirits as well. So, I mean, I like their products, but not the stock. <laughs> I had invested it for a long, long time, but you know, the returns are always subpar and valuations are always expensive. And it's a mm. difficult business, you know, because there are a lot of state level controls on distribution, on pricing, and therefore, you know, one quarter goes good, two, three quarters go bad. Mm. Uh, but, you know, it's a steady performer, and if you were to wanted to have an exposure to FMCG, I would still yeah. look at a company like United Spirits, or even better, I think, United Breweries. Because some relaxation on you know low alcohol content uh, beverages like beer mm. can be a big uh, positive for United Breweries, and I think the competitive uh, so, you know kind of play in beer side is little less than what we are seeing on the spirits side. So I would prefer breweries over spirits. Good I to hear. I liked how he put. Uh... United Spirits and Breweries in the fast-moving consumer goods category. No, I like the way Dipan said, but he likes the products, but may not be the stock too much. You know, Dipan, good to hear you still like the product because there's plenty of competition out there. Yeah? Look at Indri. Indri has clocked uh, 100,000 cases, uh, you know, in just two years of launch, and it's occupying 30% of the market share here in India. So, splendid stuff out there. More amount That's of good. variety, more amount of choice. Stocks aside... A variety for consumption is there. But uh, let's discuss another stock with you, uh, Deepa. And Manglam joins us to tell us about Concord because they released their quarter for business updates. And it appears in terms of the guidance, they have missed that. Manglam, go ahead. Well, you know, uh, the management spoke to CNBC, TV18, post their third quarter numbers. And at that point, the nine-month volumes were closer around 7.2%. And the management still was pretty confident of going ahead and doing 10 to 12% volume growth uh, for the entire year versus the nine month growth of just about 7.2%. At that time itself, looking at the macros, the street chose not to believe them. And now the numbers are here for us and they miss those estimates. So total volumes of the first, fourth quarter grew at 11.2%, exim volumes 9.7% and domestic volume 16%. Quarter on quarter, this is an improvement in terms of their volumes, but it's below their expectations or below their own guidance as well. So for the full year, total volume growth guidance was 8.2%. Uh, the company's uh, rather volume growth guidance was 10 to 12%. The company's reported 8.2%. Exim volumes, 8.2% growth versus target of 10 to 12%. Domestic volume, 12.3% versus target of 15 to 20%. So there has been a mild miss on their volumes, but the good part here is that they have been on a recovering path. And going forward, it'll be very interesting to see whether volumes come by with uh, the DFC coming on uh, stream, etc. or not, is the question. And the second thing that we'll be watching out for is, are the internals, apart from the volumes, how much of that is double stacked? What have been the curtailment of losses that they've done due to empty running? And uh, the operational details with realizations would be important to watch in the numbers. But as of now, as far as the volumes are concerned, they're below street expectations, though improved in the fourth quarter. Okay, all right, Mangalam, thanks a lot uh, for that. Uh, Deepan, I wanted uh, your view on Concord. You know, the numbers looked a little bit disappointed, but as Mangalam said, the street would have thought at the end of quarter three itself, they're unlikely to meet the guidance that they were putting out. You know, I was lucky uh, with regard to this double stack, single stack. I visited Gateway Distri Parks uh, in Delhi, and I had a chance to actually see how things work out there. Uh, quite interesting to see how things shape up for these companies going ahead, but on Concord, because that's obviously the much larger player. What's your view on Concord? Again, another company which has not performed up to street expectations, perhaps below its potential. Maybe there are PSU constraints. And, you know, we've been hearing about this dedicated trade corridor making a big difference to uh, increase in container traffic and how that would benefit container cooperation. But so far, it's not visible in the numbers. I think uh, they really strive to get to double-digit kind of volume growth, which is what, you know, can get us interested in the stock. I mean, look at the entire spectrum of, uh, you know, logistics play. I would say that, you know, there are better plays. You mentioned Gateway District Parks, and you could even add Adani Ports to it, uh, where I think we are seeing significant growth rates and valuations, I think, are still on the reasonable side. Uh, and I think that as far as privatization of Container Corp is concerned, I think that's looking more and more remote at this point of time. Uh, so I would just, you know, put Container Corp on hold. And, you know, wait for a couple of quarters when you see significant volume growth because of uh, perhaps change in underlying fundamentals or something structural has taken place. And then look at buying Concord. But yes, Adani Ports, Gateway District Park, I think those are interesting stories one should certainly track as and when Exim trade uh, starts to pick up in true earnest.
Okay, all right, uh, Deepa, and you know, and at Gateway District Parks, at least since I was tracking that company when I visited, the valuations are half of Concord. Concord trades at more than 25 times EV upon a beta. Gateway District Parks trades at around 12 times EV upon a beta, but a much, much smaller player. Yeah, Prashant. You know, just want to highlight uh, uh, the market, which is now under 22,300 uh, once again. So this is as we head into the last 40 odd minutes of trade. And look at something like a Vedanta. You know, from uh, it's basically lost about 15 bucks from the top. Uh, from 385, it's down to 368, 369. Uh, so that's a bit of a knock which uh, Vedanta has taken. But of course, I mean, you've got to uh, look at the fact that last fortnight or so, it's been up some 25%. So in a very short time span, a pretty large move and uh, a bit of a pullback. We'll take a break. We're back. Nimesh Chandan, CIO at Bajaj FinServe Asset Management will be with us on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Well, the markets are under pressure, but let's focus on one company from the telecom space. Vodafone Idea announced its FPO. The company plans to raise around 18,000 crore rupees via this process. Reema Tendulkar quizzed the management during a press conference on their 5G rollout plans, the tariff hikes, and other important issues. Let's listen in to what the management had to say. Our plan is to roll out 40% of our revenue coverage over the next 24 to 30 months. So that is our plan, let's say, for the next two, two and a half years. Uh, we have all seen how 5G has evolved, and generally we will be uh, calibrated in our 5G investments as we progress, because it is important that we deploy 5G where it makes sense. But in terms of an overall target is 40% revenue coverage over the next two to two and a half years. Okay. Uh, on tariff hikes, since that's one of the major drivers for ARPU increase, when do you think we are likely to see a tariff hike and your own expectation of how much are we going to see? How much can the industry absorb? The market, sorry. So I would say that in terms of timing, unfortunately, I cannot give you any guidance at this point of time. I can only allude back to the factors which make the need for tariff correction very important. First is, as I said, India has amongst the lowest TARPU amongst major economies in the world, one-third of China or less than one-third of China. Secondly, none of the operators in India are returning their cost of capital, and you heard commentary from peers as to what is the ARPU level needed for getting to a place where you can cover your cost of capital. We are way below that. The third is that ARPU will increase just by way of upgradation. So on the point of tariff, difficult to say when it will happen. We have some expectation. I cannot uh, mention that here right now. But your own internal expectation, do you think it's likely in this calendar year after elections? Uh, unfortunately, it's a valid question, but I'm constrained not to be able to answer that at this point of time. In terms of size of increase, I think you have seen what kind of increases have happened in the past. And I would say that should be a reasonable, reasonable. way to think about it. How much of, uh, what about uh, Indastar's receivables? Have you earmarked, uh, you know, from the fundraise, how much will go to pay off Indastar's receivables? So I think we have given the details of uh, the utilization of funding. Part of it is for CAPEX, part of it is for spectrum payments. There's an amount which is under general corporate purposes, which we can use as per our discretion. Uh, but you would have also seen the RHP that uh, we cannot use the funds for making any payments to promoter or promoter group companies, and that would be the governing factor. 
Okay. Uh, just one more question. Um, just doing the math, if once the moratorium comes to an end in the second half of FY26, uh, the math seems to suggest that it will be difficult for you to meet the obligations. What is the government's thinking on the way forward, since they are the largest, single largest stakeholder? Is there a possibility we will see some relief from the government? Maybe the moratorium gets extended. So let me answer that, and if uh, Sushil or Ravinder want to add anything, I'll uh, request them to do so. Fundamentally, uh, if you recollect the reforms package which was announced in September 21, the government had provided for that that the installment series, which is arising out of the deferment of four years, which will start after September 25. As for the reforms package, that can be converted to equity by the government. So I would say that uh, we plan to pay the government installments out of our cash generation. However, there is a government support available in the form of the reforms package which states that some installments or whichever can be converted at the government's option. So the government support exists in a way there. But that will entail a large dilution converting some of those installments into equity. So, let's say that today the government is at 32% shareholding. <clears throat> With this issue making certain assumptions, they would get to a 24% shareholding. You can do your own calculation, but our rough sense is that if that conversion were to happen, they will probably not exceed the levels or they would be in the ballpark of the levels where they are today. So I don't think that is a cause of concern for us. Well, that's Vodafone idea talking about that mega follow-on public offer that the company has launched and uh, what it will mean for, of course, uh, the, you know, the firm getting a fresh equity lease of life and the government's own interest and its own equity stake in a Vodafone idea. Well, let's uh, stick to some more stocks that are in focus today and Senko is one of them, which has been buzzing right from the morning. It's still retaining a gain of almost 18% after the Q4 update came in and it looked pretty good. Uh, so, Manglam, I guess the street is liking it and, and maybe also given what we've seen, I mean, I'm not comparing at all, very different animals, but what Titan did, what Kalyanjulas went on and did and maybe now all hopes and eyes on Senko. Well, you know, ever since Titan and Kalyan Jewelers reported their quarterly update, Senko was a stock which was doing well already. It was a 720 rupees stock which uh, went into uh, the quarterly update at around 800 rupees. And now as we speak, it's rallied all the way up to 950. So a lot of the street was betting on Senko and more so the organized jewelry players to do better this time around for a couple of factors. One, the industry is shifting from unorganized to organized and that shift has been accelerated by the increasing gold prices itself. And that's something that the management told us uh, and they've told the press as well in the press release. Importantly, what's uh, doing well for them is the fact that apart from, uh, you know, a 39% growth that the company has reported, which is backed by over 20% same-store sales growth, the studded ratio for them has improved. Uh, all the others are seeing some sluggishness in their studded business, but Senko has gone ahead and increased their studded ratio from 10.4% to 11.4%, and that typically does well for their margins. And earlier, they would not increase the stores at the pace that they have done in the fourth quarter in FY24 itself, all thanks to some of the money that they've got during the IPO as well. So 24 stores this year, which is the highest that they've added in a calendar year or rather in a financial year ever since their inception. So all these factors working well for them along with 13% uh, gold volume growth and 19% diamond volume growth in FY24 with the management saying the first quarter of FY25 looking extremely strong with the recent con uh, recently concluded festive season in the eastern part of the country along with Akshay Tritya going ahead with the wedding season. So all these things looking well for Senko and the discount that it trades uh, at versus say a Kalyan Jewelers or Titan was also high and now it's beginning to narrow. Okay, got that. Manglam, thank you very much. So Senko is indeed an interesting story as is Vodafone idea actually, the previous stock, the previous company that we were discussing. Vodafone right now is uh, uh, clocking close to 13 rupees. Yeah, 13 rupees 20 paise. The high that we saw was earlier year, uh, earlier this year and the high took uh, Vodafone idea almost up to 17. So, Deepan, now just some closing thoughts on, on these stocks as well. Let's start with Vodafone and given everything that's going on, the company's renewed trust in terms of getting equity, uh, promoters infusing some money and now this FPO. What's your sense? Would you look at uh, buying, and I know it's not for the faint-hearted, but would you look at buying Vodafone now? No, I think there's going to be speculative interest in the IPO and what price is going to come and that may provide a bit of an arbitrage. Uh, but, you know, I think with every passing month, it's becoming clear that Vodafone will survive. And that's great news for its consumers and even better news for Indus Towers. And stock, of course, Indus Towers is reflecting that optimism. 
but on a fundamental basis, you can't buy Vodafone unless they start to, you know, really report profits and uh, kind of report financial numbers which are in line with its peer group. And maybe if they have a few more such fundraising and if the RPU also starts to move up, then it will reach that particular zone where it is really profitable and a value creator. But from a fundamental perspective, it's better to just wait and watch. But yes, I think once markets stabilize and how this IPO plays out, there could be some amount of uh, you know trading bounce in Vodafone. And as I said, there's an opportunity in the IPO as well. Okay. You know, as uh, the management was saying, how much is, is going to be the uh, conversion, if that is required, uh, you know, all the loans, et cetera, which have been given, uh, how much will they be able to repay over a period of time when bank lines, et cetera, open up post the FPO and what will be the conversion and the dilution for non-promoter, non-government shareholders, et cetera, uh, that is unknown at this stage. A lot needs to go right uh, for this one to work. But yeah, as you said, lots of interest uh, around the FPO. Uh, thanks very much, Deepan. Great to have you with us here. Nimesh Chandan is with us, CIO at Bajaj FinServe Asset Management. Uh, Nimesh, uh, good afternoon. Good to have you with us here. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, 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 Nimesh, so tell us what uh, you've been, you and your team have been doing uh, at uh, Bajaj FinServe AMC. Uh, markets have done very well and uh, it's been like a rising tide. Uh, and will, will the uh, tide keep rising? Uh, are we going to see a little, little bit choppy waters here? What's your sense? Uh, good afternoon, Prashant. Good to be on your show. Well, at Bajaj Finserv AMC, we've been bullish on the equity markets and we are seeing the trend play out. We measure the markets on two different parameters. One is on the fundamental basis and we also measure a behavioral or a sentiment index, which tells us the direction that the market mood is. And uh, we find that uh, at this level, Nifty is close to its uh, fair value, not overvalued. Uh, the small cap and the mid cap space are about 20 to 25 percent overvalued. And in terms of the behavioral index, we still see positive signs. So we believe that uh, at least the large cap space can continue to drift upwards even from these levels, uh, despite the concerns that we are hearing for the last three days. Uh, Nimesh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, would love to hear more about this behavioral indicator. We don't discuss it that often. Usually we, we stick to, you know, discussing price to, uh, price to earnings, price to book, just pure valuation metrics. So tell us, why, what do you mean by this behavioral indicator and why does it give you the comfort that perhaps there's some more upside to this market? So this is a study we've been doing uh, for quite some time and now we have a back data of about 20 years on how this index works. The idea is that markets like a pendulum don't uh, stop at its fair value. They don't stop at the center. They swing based on optimism and pessimism. Uh, sometimes numbers create stories, sometimes stories create numbers. So people get uh, involved in the market with emotions and we need to gauge which side this pendulum is moving. And uh, typically when people are bullish, uh, they express it in terms of price action in certain asset classes. Like for example, a simple way would be like, you know, the action between small cap and large cap. It tells you where the market is bullish or bearish in terms of government uh, securities and corporate bonds, where the markets are more keen uh, to pick up, say, the spreads in the corporate bonds versus government securities or DMs versus EM. So we have about 16 different data points that consolidate into this behavioral index. And this index has been right 75% of the time in the signal that it provides us. In fact, we've launched a balance advantage fund on the basis of this index. And uh, right now, so the index gave a bull call in uh, April of 2023 and continues to be on the bullish side, even currently. Okay. About the bottom, right? I guess April 23 is when, you know, this fantastic rally really began last year. <laughs> no, absolutely. In the broader market, right? Mid caps and small cap, yeah. the move really began. By the way, the market's at the day's low now. Uh, so just a quick point there. Uh, so two, uh, 22, 263 was the low. We had a 22, 268. Uh, as things stand right now, and uh, it's it's interesting because let me just take a look at what uh, where the largest pressure is coming from. It's banks mainly. If you can have ICICI Bank and HDFC Bank between the both of them, uh, that's about 80 index points gone. Uh, so uh, that's the uh, bulk of the pressure at the day's low. ICICI Bank and a, a similar will be the case for HDFC Bank as well. Uh, you look at uh, the other ones, of course, are TCS. T, uh, TCS, of course, is uh, under pressure. 
down 1.5%. Infosys, which we'll report this week, that's down as well. Uh, it's adding about 10, 12 index points. There's a few others as well. But, I mean, this is the bulk of where the pressure is really uh, coming from. There's only one, uh, actually two names, uh, ONGC and Hindalco, which are doing anything of sort of meaningful uh, sort of pulling on the other side, lifting on the other side. Otherwise, it's a down and out. So, 22, 266, very, very close to the morning lows and slight, un just under below uh, the very short-term moving averages, which is the 20-day average, which as of yesterday's close was at about 22,270. I mean, a kind of decisive close under it uh, will uh, start to uh, open up more downsides, at least in the very near term. That's been the experience. I mean, it's acted as a very good indicator uh, for the short term, at least. Uh, Nimesh, uh, what uh, what would you uh, <clears throat> what would you do uh, at uh, in terms of sectors and sort of preferences and what you would be bullish on, where you would be cautious? Give us some color. So let's take uh, market segment by segment. Uh, we are seeing more opportunities in large caps compared to mid and small. So the risk return payoff is better here. Although I would also say in the same breath that the market cap of the company doesn't tell you anything about the wealth creation opportunity in that company. So for example, today if at our fund, we get an idea which is a good business and a good management at reasonable valuations. We won't reject it just because it's a small cap uh, company. But as a category, there seems to be more better risk return payoff in the large caps. In terms of styles, we believe quality is a style where you see actually a good contrarian bet can be taken. So companies uh, in the quality side, which have good cash flow, good return on capital, some of them which have underperformed for last three, five years are at the cusp of a turnaround. And some of them could be in the consumer side, some of them on the chemical side, some of these sectors which have not performed or contributed uh, are likely to see an upturn. There are already green shoots in these segments, and we are taking some of the contrarian calls in these uh, sectors. Now, regarding some of the export-oriented companies, possibly the first half of the year is a bit soft. Maybe we start seeing some recovery in the second half, and specifically in the fourth quarter, we should see some normalization of business there. Because the, globally, we are seeing some kind of a downturn, but Hopefully, in six months, we see a soft landing and bottoming out of uh, these sectors. Mm, okay. Uh, so, those are uh, sort of some ideas that you're working with. I was just looking at some stocks that are moving right now, and now one of them that really catches the eye is Ashiana Housing, 16% up in a weak market, decent volumes as well. The market cap of this company is closer to 3,800 crores. And what seems to have gotten the market excited is the fact that they apparently sold out all of their 224 flats in a Gurgaon project in a matter of 15 minutes. Now, that's Ashiana housing for you and that's the real estate market for you. Nimesh, what are your thoughts? I mean, uh, uh, true to form, a lot of these companies of all sizes, all hues, they have been reporting very good sales numbers. The stocks have also moved up. How are you looking at real estate and the ancillary plays? Real estate is actually in a very good cycle. Uh, we are seeing an uptick in the residential bookings. So we are, I think, at a, close to the all-time high in terms of bookings or probably just crossing that. Uh, on the commercial side also, if you see in India, we've seen a lot of these uh, co-share, uh, co-workspace sharing companies picking up large chunks of good real estate. And also a lot of MNCs picking up, uh, uh, say, commercial spaces, uh, in the country. So real estate is, I think, in a very sweet spot. We should see continuation of this good time for the next few years. Uh, as a house, we are also looking at some of the ancillary plays that come when real estate starts moving. So this is one sector that is good for the economy. It impacts several other sectors. So we are looking at companies, say, in uh, the pipes, uh, uh, tiles, faucets, uh, so all the ancillary plays that come, including the ceiling fan, AC, everything. So uh, maybe from here on, we'll see some kind of a downstreaming of activity and business going there. Some of those companies are positioned with good brands and good valuations. Mm, white goods, right? I mean, durables, basically, where uh, there could be uh, some interest which comes back. Chemicals, uh, Nimesh, did you touch upon that? That's a contrarian call, right, uh, that you guys are making. Uh, so is it agri-chemicals, is it specialty, bulk? Thing. Sorry, go on. So one of the first, uh, I think, houses who 
uh, came and said that we are positive on chemicals. We are seeing signs of bottoming out. Uh, we've been talking to companies, looking at different segments. It's large space chemicals. We are seeing definite signs of turnaround and sequential improvement in uh, business as well as uh, prices. Some segments, for example, agrochemicals is still a bit slow, but uh, dye chemicals and pigments, specialty chemicals, they are all seeing a good turnaround and we should see some sequential pickup in them. The good thing is market has been like you know, not expecting much from these companies. They have been underperformers for quite some time. Though some of them have very good return on capital and good growth plans, uh, they have been lingering at the same level as last three years and maybe at the lowest valuations they were in the last three to five years. So this is a very good area to go fishing. You'll find more fishes and less water. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's good to hear. That's good to know. So I guess that's the pond to be in. Uh, good conversation, Nimesh. Thank you very much. We hope to see you more often on the show. Really appreciate you taking out the time. Well, with that, let's move on and bring in Nimesh for D Street Chatter because the street has been reeling under pressure throughout the session today. Nimesh, lots of uh, sort of weakness. And the second dip, that's been a little uh, little more uh, sort of overbearing. Uh, yes, sir, so, no, at days low. But again, you know, uh, the biggest worry for the market seems to be the geopolitical risk. And that's clearly weighing on the, on the investor sentiment. And so, in fact, I spoke to some large investors and they all seem to be alluding to this fact that if this gets escalated, you probably will see a, a further sell-off in the Indian market. So, you know, that's going to be a big... A uh, big uh, event to track, at least in the near term. That's overall feedback. From an institutional point of view, again, a mixed year. We saw a big sell-off on Friday from the larger FIs. It doesn't look like there's going to be that large a number, but still, uh, they, they potentially could be on the sell side. Uh, but within that, I guess the only only large cap space which has been well bid are the PSU names. Selective buying continues from the in the PSU basket is uh, from a flow perspective. Uh, from a from a sector point of view, uh, again, you know, metal has been the sector of the series, continues to be outperforming uh, even in, even in today's market. On the other side, IT is under pressure, even though, uh, you know, TCS reported good numbers. And banks have been a big drag as well, especially the large private banks in today's market. So, looks like that's, there is an FI angle to it. Some bit of sell-off clearly there from the larger FIs in the, in the financial names. Uh, a word on the, on the overall, uh, you know, broader markets. While the, while the Nifty mid-cap index has recovered from the day's low, it's still down 1.5%. A lot of stocks have do recovered, but again, the, the feedback seems to be, but needs to be very, very careful. Because if this geopolitical risk, uh, you know, takes off, and it gets escalated, you will see sharp sell-off in the, in the broader market. So that's, that's a word of caution out there. But clearly from a larger uh, h &I and large investors' point of view, the geopolitical risk is a big event to track, at least in the near term. Nimesh, hmm. uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, what about stocks? So what are you picking up? Well, Prashant, in terms of individual names, the first stock is HUL. Within the FMCG basket, this is one stock which is under pressure, largely on sell flow. So there is a very strong sell flow from larger FIs. So expect high delivery volumes. And looks like some larger FI seems to be active sellers in HUL today. The second stock is HEG. In a weak market, uh, HEG is buzzing in trade, not only today, but if you look at this month's chart, the stock is up 34 odd percent and, and been a big outperformer. In fact, uh, uh, I understand a domestic mutual fund has been an active buyer of late, and the city is anticipating a corporate development as well in HEG very soon. So that's, that's the trigger for the stock to outperform. The third stock is Apollo Tires. That, even that stock is under pressure, uh, largely on self flows, but, but also there is a Morgan Stanley tactical node. A couple of peer companies have reduced the, you know, the tire prices and there is going to be commodity inflation as well. So could be, there could be margin pressure. So that's the reason why Apollo Tire is under pressure. And the last name is sale. While the stock uh, you know, did fell from the high, day's high under pressure today, but there are buy flows from larger h is what I understand. Some large h investors seem to be quite active buyer as well in sale of late. So while the stock is under pressure, there is accumulation happening in sale in today's market. Okay, got that. Thank you very much, Namesh, for uh, all the buzz and all the action that's uh, coming out there on individual stocks as well. We will take a break on that note, come back on the other side and uh, get you more on the markets, including, of course, a couple of calls with Mitesh Thakkar on uh, the trading ideas that you can work with just before close.
Welcome back. Well, you're with us on Closing Bell. As promised, let's get some final trades in, given uh, this week close. What's the advice? Mitesh is back with us. Mitesh, the final call now. Uh, I guess the second dip has been a little more brutal for the bulls. What are the levels that you would like to keep in mind and any final trades? See, I think the banks have been hit more in the second dip. <clears throat> That's where the pressure is coming. So, therefore, I think, you know, we'll maintain a negative bias and... Uh, uh, I have actually uh, a STVT on Hero Motors. It was a sell call a couple of days back. Uh, even now, I think it looks weak. So there could be continuation. So STVT here with a stop at 4,400. And look for a target of around 4,350, 4,340. Uh, and an STVT on Berger page with a stop at 550 for targets of uh, 535. Market uh, at the 20-day, 20, 20 Mitesh again, right? Uh, so more downsides, as you were saying earlier. I think, awesome. Prashant, I think you know yeah. you have you will have supports in a declining market. You will have <clears throat> resistance in a, in a rising market. The idea is that the overall bias and the structure looks slightly on the negative side. So I I would pray prob probabilities and I think there's a, st a stronger chance of us declining rather than rising from here. Got it. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mitesh, uh, for that. So uh, more uh, with Mitesh later. But 22 268 is where we are uh, trading at right now. Uh, we'll uh, welcome in Amrish Baliga, who is with us. Uh, Amrish, good afternoon. Good to have you with us here. Thanks very much uh, for your time. You know, we were we had Nimesh Chandran of Bajaj Finserv AMC. They were saying that they have a contrarian call on chemicals for a while now. Uh, your pick is from the space, uh, Anupam Rasayan. Talk to us about that before anything else. Uh, in fact, uh, I've also been positive on uh, the specialty chemical space for a while. Uh, and basically, it's a contract call, which means uh, one will require a lot, a, lot, a lot of patience. And I think the whole uh, uh, story should play out over the next uh, two to three years. But uh, currently, my uh, call is on Anupam Rasayan. But this is a next uh, possibly six to eight month call. Uh, Anupam Rasayan is uh, among the leading companies in uh, custom synthesis uh, and manufacturing of specialty chemicals uh, with a 40-year track record. They have about six manufacturing plants in Gujarat. And this uh, cramps market uh, is actually growing uh, uh, on uh, like double digits, expected to grow in double digits over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, basically, the end user demand is increasing. And uh, we have a China plus one story really playing out well in this space. And they cater to many multinational uh, customers like Syngenta, Sumitomo, Basif, Bayer Crop Science, UPL, about 29 MNC customers across uh, Europe, uh, Japan, United States, Singapore, and India. And their focus is on fluoro-based chemicals. And in Q3, they had launched uh, six new molecules, totally 11 new molecules in nine months, FI24, till December. Uh, but, but the Q3 numbers were a bit weak. Uh, I mean, the top line uh, fell, but the EBITDA margins actually improved. Uh, and because of which uh, the stock actually corrected decently well. And I believe this is a good opportunity to buy uh, from uh, the medium term perspective as well as the long term perspective. Since the pipeline is extremely good, I mean, they have about 90 new products in the pipeline, possibly over the next uh, three to four years. And the management also has been quite upbeat on a bounce back in FI25. And I believe the EBITDA margins uh, is sustainable at about 20 or 30 percent. I'm expecting an EPS of about 34 for FI26. And my medium term target is 1,020, but the longer term target is much higher. Okay, that's Anupam Rasayan, uh, the stock of choice for Amarish. Just looking for some more uh, names that are managing to buck the trend in this weak market. One is CSB Bank, Nigel alerted us uh, on this earlier. We spoke about Aishana Housing, even Purvankara from the real estate space, by the way, is having a very good session, 9.5% up on Purvankara. Uh, and uh, uh, then there are uh, some more names. Uh, Senko, of course, we've already mentioned. So these are some of the ones that are bucking the trend in otherwise what is a very weak market. Amrish, hi, good afternoon. Any good afternoon. thoughts on some of these uh, smaller real estate plays? I mean, uh, Ashyana Housing, Purvankara, some of these stocks are really flying through today. Yeah, I mean, if you look at uh, the string of stories which are coming from each of them, I mean, clearly it is on the demand. And most of them are able to sell off their projects quite fast. And this is basically because if you see uh, like the premium uh, real estate, when I say premium real estate, I'm talking of anything between 8 to uh, 10, 12 crores. I mean, they are getting sold like hotcakes because most of the CXOs and senior employees have in fact uh, uh, I mean, created wealth over the last, uh, I mean, especially three, four years post-COVID. Because if you look at the salary hikes, they have been extremely good. And in addition to that, I think there have been decent amount of ESOPs 
which most of these people have got and they've encashed. So the first thing that they do is upgrade the lifestyle and they go in for, for uh, premium properties. So if you look at the demand across, it is not speculative. It is actually end user demand, which is uh, I mean, extremely stable. And again, if you look at the real estate prices, they have not really, I mean, moved up as much as what we have seen in the past. I mean, if you look at the way the prices have gone up from 2003 to 2008, 9, I mean, today it's hardly any, I mean, uh, anything of that sort. So what we are seeing is real demand, and that is what is extremely good for the real estate companies. And if you see, look at the uh, like the listed entity, entities which are there, they are much more professional today than what they were about 15, 20 years back. They are quite transparent, and I think that's what is giving them uh, like better valuations. Um, I mean, uh, given the scenario. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Amrish, uh, you know, stay with us. We'll take a break here. There's about seven minutes to go for close. We are back in just a bit. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we basically will, with six minutes to go, looks like we're going to end pretty much at uh, the 20 day moving average on the Nifty, which is pretty much at the day's lowest level, close to the day's lowest level or so. Now, as Tesla chief Elon Musk's India visit near, stocks of various anticipated announcements is picking up pace. Sources, sources suggest that Tesla has been in talks with local businesses for sourcing supply chain, which includes a strategic partnership with a Tata Group company. Nisha is here with details she's picking up on this. Nisha, over to you. Thanks for that, Prashant. Uh, while uh, Elon Musk's India visit is going to be very, very closely watched out for, especially for the EV manufacturing facility here in India. But remember that the support system and supply chain uh, that he needs to really secure here in India for other allied facilities as well as components could be on top of the mind for Tesla. And therefore, sources with direct knowledge have shared with us that uh, Tesla is forming a partnership with Tata Group, Tata Electronics to secure the procurement of semiconductor chips. Now, we have seen the peak of COVID crisis as well as various geopolitical tensions across the world which have caused shortage of chip supply across the globe and that's something that Tesla would like to avert and there is a new entrant, Tata Groups, uh, Tata Electronics, which is going to start manufacturing while the manufacturing facilities are under construction right now, the next year but in advance, they could be tying up and securing the chip supply uh, to avert any supply chain risks in future. So that's what we are gathering. But remember that a lot of local tie-ups for other allied facilities, even for EV batteries, cannot be ruled out in future. All right, Nisha, thanks very much uh, for that. That's a quick update coming through. That's the CMC TV and exclusive uh, all source space information. Tata Electronics in the fray with a potential tie-up with Tesla for supplying chips locally for uh, to uh, Tesla as they start to uh, sort of sell cars here. Uh, Amrish, of course, is still with us. Uh, Amrish, uh, you know, the eco, the, the battery ecosystem is the other one, right? Excite went through the roof. Uh, and uh, there, there are, there are of course, I mean, so many players, but Excite, of course, has been the most prominent with that tie-up with two global companies. Uh, your thoughts on this space and what's the best way to get exposure? I mean, uh, since uh, Excite already has uh, that uh, thing going uh, with uh, Kia and uh, Hyundai, I think the only other big player remaining is Amaraja. So I think uh, that's one to uh, that, that's the one to be looked at, and uh, at the same time I think the other auto ancillaries uh, which are linked to EVs uh, like uh, Unipaths, you have Sona BLW, Samadhana, Madhusan. I think these are the ones uh, which I think could uh, in fact benefit uh, because of uh, Tesla coming to India. 
Amrish, LNT, I think, was one of your. Uh, was it a pick recently? A it's been for a very long time and continues to be. Yes. Okay. No, uh, th this, uh, this this city that uh, the Saudis were building, right? Neom. And yes. the news that they've cut spend on it by some 90, 95% uh, or, or so. Uh, so, I was reading a note by Kotak which was saying that, uh, you know, the sharp re-rating for LNT was largely driven by prospects of consistent growth in the Saudi business. And that seems a little uncertain now. Just wanted your thoughts here. No, I mean, I think that's more, uh, that's going to be more sentimental because the sort of order flows which are there, it's just not LNT. I mean, I'm talking of, I mean, all the uh, companies which are in that space. I think the order flows are much more, I mean, uh, like uh, they can handle. So I don't think uh, the uh, Saudi project uh, being uh, lowered will really have a major effect on uh, like LNT's performance going ahead. But yes, uh, I think uh, uh, immediate future, uh, sentimentally, it can affect to a certain extent. And in case the stock corrects because of that, I think that's a buying opportunity because if you're talking of the sort of infra growth in India, I think that's more than enough for LNT. Hmm. Okay, that's a take on LNT. And with that, uh, we'll wrap things up. Amrit, thank you very much for being with us on the show today and giving us some perspective. Well, the market is uh, pretty much ending at the lowest levels of the day, so there's no sign of uh, buyers emerging just yet. Second day running, we've had a week, week close. Friday was the first and then it's been followed up by this Monday. So about a percent lower on the Nifty with a cut of 250 points. Uh, banks and IT, those twin engines, really leading this spiral down that we've seen. The Bank Nifty is ending with a cut of over 800 points. That That's over 1.5%. And the Nifty IT, if you pull up the Nifty IT, well, yeah, that's also down about a percent and a half. So we talk about the, the loser's tally on the large cap screen. And uh, the names will reflect ICICI Bank down to 2.5%. HDFC Bank down about a percent and a half. Lever uh, is one of the other big names, LNT and Lever, some heavyweights which were doing a little more damage on the downside. And then, of course, IT stocks. Let's start with TCS, down a percent and a half. Uh, the commentary not really 